So we, we were lingering on this problem for a bit longer than I planned, but it's fine. Do you remember where we were? Basically, we looked at the case when you have an infinite chain. Just same case, k, 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 right? M, 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 goes on forever. And we figured out that you can do it by u times e to the i, k, x, right? Now, when you have k1, k2, k's, okay? So let me actually write down a diatomic infinite chain. If you go on literature, you will usually get the version of it where the masses are different. So it's like M1, M2, M1, M2, etc. Goes on forever, okay? But we discussed and I coded the one which has same M's but different K's, right? <coughs> Nothing changes with this. The important thing is that it starts repeating after some point, and it goes on forever. Dot 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 dot. It starts repeating after some point. In this particular case, the repetition, uh, the unit cell of our system is this one, right? So let me give a length to that unit cell. Let's say this is the distance A. And you have K1, K2, K1, K2. It repeats forever, right? Now, how can those two words be together? Diatomic and infinite. So what we mean here is that it's an infinite repetition of two atoms, OK? And when we started really doing atoms, weren't they just balls and, and springs? Well, turns out you can just apply the same mathematics to atoms. You just make sure that you solve the electronic problem in the case of atoms. So in the electronic systems, you have the ions. For example, you move the ion a little bit. Since ions are really heavy, you move the ion, you solve the electronic problem, and you figure out the forces on those ions. So it turns into the ball and spring problem all over again. Although solution of the electronics problem is much more complicated, okay? Same story, same story. This time you have a U1 and U2, and it just keeps repeating but with a twist, right? This one will have u1 e to the ika, u2 e to the ika, u1 e to the ika minus and u2 e to the I minus ika. Do you understand this part? Yes? So let's quickly write down the <coughs> dt squared u1. So for this atom in particular, you have the right-hand side neighbor, which will bring k times u2 minus u1, and the left-hand side neighbor, which will bring k times what? u2 times e to the minus ika minus u1. Do you agree with this? Yes? So we considered the interaction with this one and with this one. Now let's consider this one. And it will interact with this one and with that one. So I write down m d squared u2 over dt squared <coughs> equals k times, what is the first term? u1 e to the i k a minus u2 plus k times 
u1 minus u2. Okay? If you remember, over here, we got just one equation. Okay? Now we get two equations. So one equation for each atom. Okay? One equation for each degrees of freedom. One atom in one dimension gives you one equation. One atom in two dimensions gives you two equations. Two atoms in two dimensions gives you four equations. Okay? Good? Yes? Oh, yeah. Yeah, very good. Let's, let's uh, correct that. So what is the correct one for this one is K1, for this one is K2, for this one K2, for this one K1. Brilliant. Thank you very much. So the same story again. Uh, let me actually not take too much of your time and just write omega squared u2 over here with a minus sign. And this one is going to be omega squared u1 with a minus sign. So if you write it down as a matrix, this time you need to write it down as a matrix because, yes? Um, since atoms are different, are, are masses supposed to be different or the same? Are what? Is masses. Masses. Masses, yes. Very good question. So you came just a little bit late, right? Uh, because I, I mentioned that usually this system is considered with M1, M2, M1, M2, and people would put the same K everywhere, okay? We are just considering this other case, which makes no difference, really. Besides, you can also do it for different masses. Why I am not doing different masses here? Because uh, I want the, the matrix to look symmetric from the get-go. Right? I, I don't want to have square root M1, M2s at the bottom, which will make things a bit ugly. But, okay? Yeah. yeah. So, thanks for your question. Very good question. So, uh, if I s send this negative sign over there, what do I have for the 1-1 one, one term in the matrix? a to the minus i k a, right? And divided by m. Everybody agrees with this? Yes. Uh, what is the other term? It should be, it's be minus k2. It should be minus, uh, plus k2, just <coughs> plus k2. Uh, I'm also sending this minus sign to the other side, so sorry. This is like this, right? So on the other side, you have minus k1 minus k2 e to the minus ika over m. Are we on the same page or not? Yes. Uh, also on the other side, you have k1 plus k2, I presume over M. And what do we have here? We must have this one, K1 minus K2 e to the plus IKA over M. Does everyone agree with this? So what we have here is a two by two matrix and it's Hermitian, so-called Hermitian. I hope you have watched the preliminaries so this ma matrix is Hermitian in a sense that it is composed of, uh, it's symmetric. Okay, let me tell you this way. Hermitian matrices conjugate and then transpose is equal to themselves. Or transpose <coughs> conjugate. Uh, we actually show it with this kind of dagger. Okay. Do you see that it's equal to itself when you transpose and conjugate? And this kind of matrices have real eigenvalues and eigenvectors. 
right? So how do you find your eigenvalue here in this case? Uh, you get the determinant and set it to zero, right? You will get a second order equation and the solutions will give you two solutions. So you are going to get, actually, now we can switch to the code. Do you see that matrix here? Let me just make it bigger for you. Is it too big? Yes. Do you see that matrix is given here? So what this code is doing, uh, it's plotting uh, phonons. I will tell you what phonons are. What is it doing? It's taking A, the distance to be 1, the masses to be 1, K1 to be 1. And then it's getting this matrix and it's calculating the eigenvalues for every K while k is changing between minus 2 pi and 2 pi, right? And what do we do next? <coughs> we basically create an array and we plot the results. So we are plotting the phonons for, ah, okay. Now I remember why I made it into a function. I was thinking why I made it into a function. Do you now get why I made it into a function? After this line? Yeah. I made it because I want an interactive plot where I can change K2, okay? And each time I change K2, it goes ahead and constructs those matrices for every K value and finds omegas and plots them. So you see, this is the plot for k2 equals to 1. k1 is 1, k2 is 1. Then it's already the monatomic chain uh, situation, right? So that's why you are actually getting the same thing here. Do you see this? Yes. This is the same thing that we got before. But now when I change k2, there is a band gap opening there. Do you see? When K2 is different from K1, then you, it becomes a diatomic uh, system. Even if K2 goes below 1, then the gap opens again. Okay? So you, you go from one band structure to two band structure. Okay. This thing that we are seeing here, frequency versus the wave number is called a phonon plot, okay? What is a phonon? Okay, what is electron? Electron is a particle, right? Fundamental particle. Uh, and phonon is not a fundamental particle. It's the unit of atomic lattice vibration. So when you have a field of vibration Okay, now I will not make sense, right? You have to know first quantization, second quantization, and things like that. But in any case, just like things act as waves and particles at the same time, right? Similarly, the atomic vibrations are creating the waves, right? But those waves also act as particles, okay? And those particles are called phonons. So when you shoot a neutron into a lattice, let's say you have a crystal and you have some phonons, right? There's a chance that that neutron goes and interacts with phonons, which is atomic lattice vibrations, and changes its direction. And you can find the amount of energy and the amount of momentum imparted on that neutron by a specific phonon. So you can you can gain, by neutron diffraction experiment, you can gain the phonon dispersion relation experimentally. And you will compare these two things. They will be the same. OK? So they are real, uh, as real as you are. OK? 
th they are important, as I mentioned in the first, in the zeroth lecture, uh, they, the phonon calculation, phonon dispersion relation is my most important plot in my career. Do you remember that phonon plot? Um, I don't know if we can pull it out now, but there are lots of things that you can learn from phonon plots. For example, there, is always, there are always modes that go to zero when k goes to zero. Are you bored? No, no right? Not yet. <laughs> you will be bored at around 3 o'clock. So k equals to zero is a very long wavelength thing. So it's like moving the crystal all together, right? And you, if you have the mode that corresponds to the, do you remember the modes that were moving together? Yeah. So you have the same thing in a whole crystal as well. Imagine moving the whole crystal together, there will be no restoring force, right? So this is a one dimensional crystal, so you get a one mode that goes to zero. And this tells you actually an important thing. The slope here actually tells you the sound velocity in that atomic chain, okay? If you have a 3D crystal, let's say you have a 3D crystal, iron or something, right? Can you move iron in X? Yes, you can. Can you move in Y? Yes, you can. Can you move in Z? Yes, you can. And for each movement, you will get uh, an acoustic mode that goes to zero. So you will get three acoustic modes. And those acoustic modes, the slope of them will tell you what is the sound velocity inside iron. Okay? That's one thing. The other thing are the, these modes that, so we call them acoustic modes because of this. They are related with the acoustic properties of the material. These modes we call optical modes because they are not the modes that go together. They are usually in involving vibrations, opposite motions. And you can excite those opposite motions by shining light, okay? So when you shine light, it doesn't excite these kinds of motion. It does excite these kinds of motion. So we call them optical modes. Just the general information. Any questions? Hmm? Yeah, 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 yeah. The ones that go to zero as k goes to zero are acoustic modes. Okay, there are three of them in a normal crystal, uh, and the rest are optical modes. Yeah. Does it make sense? Oh, good. Whatever. Uh, like arbitrary units. Uh, arbitrary units. Uh, I mean, of course, if we, b why arbitrary units? Because we didn't mention units also for A, for M, for K1. But if you put proper units, so are you trying to compare these values with actual terahertz something, etc.? Don't do that because this is imaginary ball and spring. It's not actual carbon and their bonds, right? If you put carbon and their bonds, for example, then you will, let me show you graphene's modes. Oops. Graphene uh, phonons. Actually, this one also has names in it, but this one is a little bit, yes. So, three acoustic modes. Although it's a two-dimensional material, graphene is a two-dimensional material, but it still lives in a three-dimensional space, right? So it has three acoustic modes and three optical modes, okay? Notice that one of the acoustic modes actually have zero velocity. 
do you see like there are two acoustic modes one like this one like that and the other one is actually quadratic it starts like this now what can be the reason is it along the z axis exactly so along z axis graphene cannot propagate anything so sound velocity in that direction is zero so it starts not linearly but quadratically okay Lots of things that you can learn, right? Yeah. Yes. Uh, for the electronic band structure, let's say band gap signifies something. Here in common band structure, does the band gap signify? Uh, it signifies similar things. Uh, like OK. We can look at the modes right at those points, but I am not really super prepared to answer that question. So let me answer that question next time, okay? With the proper codes and whatnot. Uh, the thing that happens right here uh, at the boundary of the brilliant zone is called Bragg reflection, okay? You are getting a Bragg reflection. Let me talk more about it next time. <coughs> but in general, Whenever you think that you understand band gaps or bands in general, like uh, it's you are somewhere here of the logarithm, and you are just you just don't know that there are ten times more understanding <laughs> once you spend the time. Uh, so I always feel myself that I never understand them. As far as I understood them, I am telling you them. Okay. But otherwise, they are complicated stuff to understand. How do you understand electronic bands? Like the band gap, what, what does it signify to you? Basically, if there's a like, huge gap, there are insulators. Yes. Gap is ah, OK. In that sense, we do have it here. So you said Yes. So when is something a metal, when it's uh, when it's uniform propagating electrons, electron is like a sea flowing everywhere, right? Then you have a metal. When it's uh, more confined, like covalent bonds, that one atom bonds to the other, the other one bonds over here, the other one bonds over here. When it's localized, then you get a band. Uh, then you get get more and more gaps. So here, what's going on is that when it's exactly one, the system is uniform and it just flows throughout uh, the place, everywhere the same. But once you start introducing, uh, what should I call this? Localized states, and you get them more and more localized as you increase the difference between K springs. So imagine a very stiff spring and very soft spring. So you get cl closer and closer to the case where they are just separate springs. OK? Uh, let me approach it from the other side. Uh, why do you get, OK, let me approach it. So do you see that also dispersion in general is shrinking down? Like the general amplitude of dispersion is shrinking down. So let me give you some analogy about that. The whole thing is, can be thought about like this. You have atom, you have discrete energy states, right? Once you start bringing them together, they form this bonding and antibonding states. Okay, you you put two together and they they split into two levels, right? You put two more and these ones split together, etc. Right? Now, if the, you put them very very close, okay, then they will interact more and more. The more they interact, the larger is this dispersion. So they start forming bands. If the interaction is less, then 
they form separate bands and the band gap in between. Yes? If the interaction is high, then sometimes these bands overlap and you have a metallic state. Yes? So, uh, I, I guess this was a too much of a detour, was it? It's fine? Did you get your answer more? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I guess so. So I think it's not too crazy to think that when you don't have too many gaps, then it's a good uh, thermal conductor. Okay, does it make sense? Sound and thermal are the same thing. Uh, I mean, at this higher level, they become the same thing. Because they are both phonons, right? Because phonons, from phonons you get sound velocity. So phonons are sound. From phonons you get heat, thermal properties. So heat and sound, they are all related. They are all coming from this spring, mass and spring system. Okay? Good, so you, if you have gaps, then you are not conducting in that regime, right? So, yeah. The, the closer you bring, uh, so I, I, I assume that this plot that shows no gaps in, uh, anywhere. Ah, I was opening this one be to show you what is this range uh, the, also. So it goes from zero uh, until inverse, it's given usually in inverse centimeters. So it goes until 1,600 inverse centimeters. You were curious about the values, right? So I was going to say that when you have carbon, actual carbon, actual springs between atoms, right? You get some actual values. That dough needs a lot of water. <laughs> That's a Turkish expression, and uh, I'm uh, so let that when I talk about electronic structure, let me come back to this. If we have enough time, I will tell. But since you asked, <laughs> since you asked, let me just briefly tell you what it is. You know how we had atoms in the real space and we had A in between and we went to the band structure which would go from minus 2 pi over A to, not, not even that, minus pi over A to pi over A. So we call this real space, okay, and this one reciprocal space. So far so good? Now, if you have a crystal, like graphene, then you have a real space. You have a baklava like this. Oops, yes. So do you see graphene there? Yes, real space, and this one has some A. Then it has its own reciprocal space and it's two-dimensional. And that two-dimensional thing looks like this. Also looks like a hexagon, okay? And these are the uh, certain names that we give to special symmetry points. This one is called gamma, this one is called M, and this one is called K. So that band structure is actually going in those directions and showing you not the whole brilliant zone, but only certain symmetry directions. Very good. Wave number is two components, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wave number has two components and you are plotting it in the most important directions. Um, what happens when we take K2 free infinity? K2 
K2 to infinity or K2 to zero. Yes. yes. What happens is that it becomes a separate chain, right? So what do we expect? We expect a flat band, okay? Because it's just something that vibrates by itself without interaction, right? So let's see if we get that or not. Oh, I can already take it here. Do you see that flat band? Yes? So this also explains a lot of things as well because that's how you get... That's how you get from bands to band, having band gaps, not having band gap, etc. Um, so, um, if we take K2 to infinity, will the um, yeah. structure of the um, blue one be the same as um, if we had um, an atom with 2m mass and an atom with m mass? Uh, let's not take K2 to infinity. Let's take K2 to 0. That way, K1 is infinity with respect to K2. But because K, if you take K2 to infinity, then these modes also go to infinity. Okay? Because they are square root K over M. But can we renormalize them? Uh, that's what we are doing by setting the other one to zero. Okay. Right? Do you accept that answer? Think about it. Okay. Very good. Any questions? No? Okay. Good. So we have explained the band gap stuff as well. Now we can move on to this newly included Fourier chapter. Right? Let's go to chapter 2. Ah, sorry, you are not seeing what I'm writing, which is just chapter two, Fourier. Okay, how do we want to start? Eventually, we want to solve heat equation. Did I send you the attendance? Please sign the attendance, okay, everyone. Okay, so if you write down heat equation, it looks like this. This depends both on x and t. And you have k del squared u over del x squared. Uh, so what do we call these things? Do you remember? Uh, wave or diffusion? diffusion? Diffusion, right? This is, what is this? Specific heat. Specific heat. This one, density. density. This one, Something about conductivity. thermal conductivity, right? And what is this one? Um, temperature. Temperature, very good. Okay, so we want to solve this problem and we will write it in a more compact way. We will just write it like this and we will call this one thermal diffusivity. Diffusivity. That even further shows that it's all about diffusion here, right? Now, how can you solve this problem? As you can see, before we had just time dependence, time derivatives. Now we have space derivatives and time derivatives together. So let's f start by focusing on space derivatives first. And let me show you the system. Let's say we go from minus L to L, and we have a function that is cosine p 
pi x over L. How does it look like? Looks something like this, right? Do you agree? What is the... It should be inverted. This is fine, right? Very good. So this is just fx. Well, why I'm bothering? I have uh, the plotted version here. fx cosine pi x over L. Now, what about its derivative? Its derivative is minus pi over L times sine x, right? And its double derivative is minus pi squared over L squared times cosine pi x L. So why we are starting with the cosine? Because as you can see, its second derivative is also cosine, right? You could have started with sine as well, or e to the i k x. But let's go with cosine, because I <laughs> wrote the whole code with cosine. So if you go with cosine, let's say you are trying to solve this problem and you say that ux at t equals to 0 was cosine pi over L times x. Okay, And we are simplifying everything. So we have a very peculiar boundary condition. We have periodic boundary condition. So this, this temperature is distributed over a ring, Okay, going from minus L all the way to L, but then, then they connect on the other side. Okay? So, do you have any solution to this that you can propose? Um, e to the plus or minus some constant time to this cosine term. Very good, very good. So, if it starts like this, then we can just straight ahead say that this is going to be minus pi, pi over L squared cosine pi over L x, right? You can just simply write this. So if the solution, the solution, so how should I call the solution? I, I will still use u. Let's say this is the solution and it has some cosine pi over L x. Can I think about it a little bit? Actually, I will go with your solution. e to the lambda t, right? And some coefficient in front of it. You like coefficients. But let me not put some coefficient. It, it started with 1, so I will just write e to the lambda t. Let me just put it in the equation and see what happens. What is del u over del t? Lambda times cosine, exactly, u, p, l, x, e to the lambda t. Now, when you put these things together, you will get your solution, right? Can I think about it for a moment? This is, if this is u of t, let me just rearrange this. Let me put it here. Let me put this one over here. So I propose this kind of a solution. Oopsie daisy. Bring it back. I propose this solution. I should really start uh, make some notes and just write from the notes because then I get confused. E to the lambda t. Did I make any error here? No. No. So what does it tell you about lambda? Since these two are equal to each other, so lambda times, so this thing, this whole thing over here, let me duplicate this one, is equal to d times this whole thing. Do you agree? Have you seen this before? Yes. Yes, right? Who have seen this before? No one else? 
Is this completely new to you? Yes? Are you following? Yes? Good. Good. <laughs> are you, though? <laughs> yes, you are following. Where is my picture? There I am. So this goes away, this goes away, this goes away, this goes away. Lambda is minus d times pi over l squared. This tells me that I have actually an analytical solution to that equation. And that analytical solution is this one. Cosine pi over l x e to the minus d pi over l squared t. Do you see? Yes? Now, this analytical solution will be helpful to us to see whether we are doing the right thing or not. Now let's do a numerical solution. So to do a numerical solution, we first need to know how to do numer numerical derivative, right? And one thing that I'm going to show you is finite difference. Do you know finite difference? Kind of. Some of you do know, some of you don't. Doesn't matter. There is an awesome page that is very simple, just this much, okay? But this page is awesome. It would give you uh, the derivative. So let's say you use a stencil minus 1, 0, and 1. It would give you the proper stencil to show you how you can use this. Can I make it bigger? Yes. It would just give you the coefficients that you need to use to get the second derivative, for example. Okay? We, you already know this is the second derivative, right? But what if you want to use more points, like minus 2 and also 2? Then it gives you the relevant coefficients. You should use minus 1, 16, minus 30, etc. Did you know this before, this web page? No. Very good. So what we are going to do is we are going to derive these coefficients ourselves, how it works. Okay? Do you need a break before doing that? You seem to be not needing a break. Sorry. <laughs> so I will go ahead with that one. Did, did you need a break? Oh. You are young people. So let me talk about finite difference. Yes, OK. There you go. So here is how we approach it. Let's say you have a stencil. By stencil, I mean this. You, you have, let's say you have chosen minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1, and 2. What does this mean? It means that you have some discrete points. And to get the derivative at this point, you are going to use this point, which is at 0, this point, which is at minus 1, the minus 2, plus 1, and plus 2. OK? That's what this stencil means. Let's say this distance is delta x. Then you are basically, your stencil is these integers multiplied by delta x. Now, you want to get your coefficients, right? For example, let me give you an example, just like here. The coefficients for minus 1, 0, plus 1, and for the second order derivative, second, oops, second order derivative, the coefficients are, what was they? 1, minus 2, and 1. So we are going to get this. Okay? 
Um, <clears throat> Let's say you are taking an nth order derivative at a certain point x. Then what you are claiming is that this derivative is equal to c1 times a function at x plus s1 times delta x, c2 times f times x plus s2 times delta x, and it goes on forever. And not forever, until you reach, let's say, c5. But you get the pattern here, right? Are you with me? Yes. So let, I'm going to get just one of this. Let me get just one of this and write it explicitly. What is fx plus s1 times delta x? It's c1 times fx plus c2 times, no, not c2, c1 times s1 times delta x over 1 factorial f prime x. Let me write one more. c1 times s1 times delta x squared over 2 factorial times f double prime x. Did you follow this? Yes? Good. Same here, same with this one, right? C1 times fx plus s1 delta x. Uh, no, I wrote the same thing. So, just you correct me if I do something wrong. For example, did I do something wrong here? No, right? S2. It should be S2. And this should be S2 delta x squared 2 factorial f double prime x. And it goes on like that, right? Well, when you sum them up over here, when you sum them up, let's sum them up over here. What do you have here? You have C1 times fx. I'm just summing up this part, okay? C1 times fx plus C2 times fx plus C3 times fx, dot, 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 until C5, let's say C5. It, it has to stop somewhere, right? You have a stencil that is finite. What this should be? what this should be equal to. Let me remind me what we are doing, okay? Let me remind me what we are doing. We first said that the derivative should be this expression plus this expression plus that expression, etc. right? Then we expanded those particular expansions, uh, expressions in Taylor series, each one of them, right? Now I'm just summing up the first term and it the first terms and it turns out to be c1 plus c2 plus c3 plus c4 plus c5 times fx now remember once you sum all of this it's supposed to be f double prime x because that's what we are shooting for right so what th this term should be No? Zero. 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 So the fx term should vanish. Yes? f prime x term should vanish. f double prime x term should stay. Okay? So you get, you get nice equations from this. So you get this should be zero, which tells you that C1 plus C2 plus C3 plus C4 plus C5 should be zero, right? What do you get from these ones? Uh, 
you are supposed to get also zero. But what is the equation? The equation is, as you can see, C1, S1, C2, exactly, delta X, I forgot, delta X. C2, S2, delta X, C3, S3, delta X, dot, 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 should be zero, right? What is the third term? Uh, this one should stay, right? Mm -hmm. So, and what it should be? One. 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 Very good. So, C1 times S1 delta X squared over 2 factorial plus C2 S2 delta X squared over 2 factorial dot, 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 should be 1. Right? Then the same thing with cubes and 3 factorial should be 0. Like there should be no third term as well and no fourth term as well. Now you can write it down as a matrix. You can just write down like this. 1, 1, so it's like 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, okay? S1 delta x, S2 delta x, dot, 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 dot. S1 delta x squared over 2 factorial, dot, 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 dot. You understand the matrix, right? Then the coefficient C1, C2, dot, 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 is equal to, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. So it's, yes? This is accurate from the fifth order. Accurate up to fifth order. Accurate up to fifth order. Very good. Okay. Are you still with me? Yes. Yes. Very good. Yes. So the larger you choose the stencil, the more accurate you become up to some point, and we will see that point, okay? Do you need a break now? Yes?